So with regards to the giant hole in the floor for the battery box, someone in my last video said I should go full Fred Flintstone. You know, where they put their feet down through the floor in their prehistoric vehicles and power it using just their legs. And while that is a valid suggestion, the answer is probably not. Whether prehistoric or post-apocalyptic, the work must continue. This video is sponsored by KiwiCo. Let's get started. So we have the boxes for the military Humvee turned electric that are gonna hold the Tesla battery modules, but the only problem is they're empty. So today we're gonna be putting our 18 Tesla battery modules inside these three aluminum boxes and putting them in the Humvee. And if everything goes according to plan, we should be able to get it rolling. In the battery box build video, we talked about how the Tesla battery modules are made, as well as how we built the battery box that the Tesla modules are going to fit into. Today we're gonna to talk more about how everything is wired. And it's important to remember that while this is all gonna sound extremely complex and complicated with a lot of big words, it's important to remember that I didn't really know much about all of this a couple years ago. But now I feel like I know pretty much what's going on, which is sometimes a dangerous place to be. The important thing to remember is electricity is extremely dangerous, and we have to wire it in a way that it's controllable while being safe ourselves and being safe for the vehicle. To summarize what's going on is we built these boxes that are modular. This is the bottom plate that the uh, Tesla modules fit into, and they're gonna rest like this. These are the high voltage components that's gonna allow everything to run. We have a BMS that monitors the voltage and temperatures and contactors that allow the electricity to flow from the batteries to the electric motor. I'll explain more about what those do after we finish wiring them up. Right now we just have them placed tentatively where they're gonna be. So we can get the 180 connections from the BMS wired into the modules. It's gonna take us a while. So it is 10 p.m. right now, and normally I like to film things once I know what's going on, but we have a little party here with Jeremy and Jacob, and I wanna show you our little setup, what we've been doing. Before I show you though, not many people are doing what we're doing, so it's, it's hard to find a tutorial on the internet. And so we've been kind of guessing and checking what's going on, and this is what our desk currently looks like. So right here we have a couple battery modules lined up. None of the batteries are connected yet, so we are just running the cell taps and thermistor wires, and that's kind of what looks like this explosion. Um, let me start over here and show you what's going on. So normally we need to connect to a low voltage system, but we're plugged into the wall outlet and this is outputting 12 volts. The 12 volts is coming over here, powering this BMS along with the thermal expansion. Hope I haven't lost you yet. This is all gonna come together in a second. The wires we're paying attention to are the white wires. The rest of these are the cell taps, which we haven't gotten to yet. These are kind of high voltage wires. They will be plugged into the battery boards and we haven't gotten to them yet. The thermal expansion is in charge of monitoring the cell temperature. So follow the wires, come over here, and we are currently monitoring the two thermistors inside of this battery module. We have two white wires and we're jumping the ground wire because that's what we were confused about. And the data is running back up to the thermistor expansion module and giving us information through these CAN wires which this is connected to the CAN network into this printer cable coming back up into my laptop where we can see that we currently have 11 degrees on one and 12 degrees on the other. Which if you're fluent in American is around 50 degrees give or take which is about the same temperature that we have in my garage. So although this setup looks incredibly unorganized it's currently working and we currently almost know what we're doing. I will give you an update once we know a little bit more. So we're still in wiring the BMS mode, but we do have to make sure all of these batteries are relatively within the same voltage range, which is an issue because I got the batteries from two separate sources. The first batch of batteries were all 24.6 volts, while the second batch of four batteries were 21.3. So what we're doing over here is we have a DC regulated power supply pushing 
two amps into this battery here to bring it up to the 24.6. All while the cells are being slowly balanced by this guy here. Fair warning, I am 100% not sure if this is the way to charge lithium ion batteries. So if the video ends here, it means this blew up and we did something wrong. All right, little update on the battery boxes for the Hummer. So we have, this is the BMS, we don't need this. So right here, um, just for the record, this is supposed to be cell tap number one, which is going to be the box behind the passenger. We're starting on the opposite end with the highest cell tap, which is gonna be here because this is our positive most battery. And that'll all make way more sense when we get the bus bars installed, this is just talking about the BMS cell tap wiring for the moment. So we have the thermistors and cell taps coming out here with about two inches of slack. And then we will have another couple inches when we bring this box closer. And then here we have the cell tap and thermistor wiring that's gonna be the same as the pinouts on this board here. And each one of these little wires is very specifically labeled because they need to be put into these plugs, plugged into the boards back here, and that's how the BMS knows which cell is which by all these wires coming out. Long story short, BMS stands for Battery Management System, and its job is to make sure that the cells are all balanced, 108 groups, as well as that the temperature never gets too high or too low. It keeps things safe for the driver, and it prevents damage to the batteries and makes sure they last for a really long time. So now we just have to get these little plugs installed and this bank should be good to go and we can install the bus bars and go from there. All right, not gonna lie, sometimes I'm working on this project and then it just hits me that this is the sickest project ever and I think this view is probably one of the best we've had. Right here, as the Hummer sits there waiting for all of the power that's coming its direction. Right now we're working on these BMS wires still but I think we've gotten the hang of how they connect through the BMS boards to the battery. So I'm gonna walk you through how we're doing this one. Once everything's wired up, we can attach the bus bars and then things will look even more cool. But that's also the same point where things get ridiculously dangerous. So I'll enjoy the part that we're at at the moment. First thing with the wire management, taking care of my wires this time around since we won't have easy access to this once we put it inside the box. I might not make you watch all of the wire connections, but I do think it's fair that you watch some of them. Since wiring the brains of the high voltage system makes wiring the brains of the low voltage system look like a cakewalk. So sit back and relax and enjoy the cell tap and thermistor wiring. Each bank of wires is divided up into colors. As you can see, we have orange, red, and yellow, each of which have 12 wires, six going to every battery. Once I've lined up the wires to where the plug is gonna be, I can snip them off, making sure to leave the number still attached to the wires, cause that delegates where they go inside of the plug. Stripping the wires is easy enough. We have this little magic tool that grabs one side of the insulation, pinches it, and exposes about one eighth inch of wire. And we do that six more times for the yellow wires, along with the two thermistors, and we'll get to the grounds in a second. Then we have to crimp the wires. So I grab my alligator crimping doohickey, and one of the metal pins that'll fit down inside of the plug. I can gently pinch it inside of the alligator until it clicks once to hold the pin in place. Then I can take my wire, slide it through the back side of the pin, and crimp it down until the wire is pinched shut. There's two pinching points, one on the insulation and the other on the wire strands itself for a secure connection. I'll have to do this for the six wires, the two thermistors, as well as the grounds. The grounds are slightly different though. Remember the thermistors are here to check the temperature, while the cell taps are here to check the voltage. For every 12 cell taps there's one ground, but for the thermistors every five wires shares one ground that we have to jump from wire to wire, daisy chaining all the grounds together to keep the connection. It's a weird system, but that's what Orion does with their BMS thermal expansion module. Like I mentioned earlier, each of the little wires are numbered and we stick them in the plug in numerical order, keeping them organized. The little pin has fins on it to grip the inside of the plug to keep it in place. We use crimps because crimps tend to hand little vibrations better than solder. Solder's brittle and wires might break off next to the solder bead. 
And since this Hummer, one of the most capable off-road vehicles of all time, is probably going to encounter some vibrations in its life, we want to use connections that will withstand it. Finally, we get to those grounding wires. The ground for the colored wires, the cell tap, is just a singular wire, and it handles the next 12 yellow wires. The ground for the thermistor, though, needs to be daisy-chained for the other thermistor going into this battery module, as well as the two thermistors in the final module. That ground is distributed to all five thermistors. It's a little more work on the battery side of things, but a little less space inside of the battery box. And we are done. All of the wires are in their connector and it's ready to be plugged into the BMS board. What's cool is that there's a small little channel inside of the Tesla battery. I'm not sure what it was used for originally, probably to keep it from shifting around inside of the Tesla, but it's the perfect spot for all of our BMS and thermistor wires. We still need to wrap it in cloth tape, of course, to make sure that the wires stay very secure and protected, and then the insulated orange bus bars will go over top. If my math is correct, I believe counting all of the thermistors as well as the cell taps, we have 189 connections. When I went and saw the Hummer EV, you know, the one that they're actually making, all of those battery modules are connected via Wi-Fi, so they don't have these 189 connections bringing all the modules together to monitor the batteries, which, after doing this, makes a whole lot of sense. If all of these battery modules were Wi-Fi, we'd already be done. So we have the passenger box, the driver box, and this is the center box, and we tentatively have laid out where all the high voltage components are gonna go. And it'll make more sense towards the end of the video when everything is actually connected. But right now, this is a Wi-Fi module. And this module will allow my computer to connect with the system so I can read the voltages and the temperature of the battery in real time. The only problem is there's no space. So what I'm gonna do is take off the top of the thermistor box, drill some holes in it, and attach my Wi-Fi module to the top. Using some isopropyl alcohol, I can remove the adhesive holding down the sticker on the top plate. Drill some holes with the drill press. And mount the Wi-Fi module on top of the thermistor expansion module with two little screws and some Loctite. It's not going anywhere. And now that it's unconventionally mounted, hopefully it allows me to communicate with my system wirelessly. Another cool gizmo on this high voltage junction plate is the circular current sensor. Remember, wires make a small magnetic field when power flows through them, and this guy can accurately measure how much of that power is flowing to and from the motor using that magnetic field, as well as how much power is going back into the batteries during regen or charging. And of course, as you've already guessed, We'll be mounting this current sensor to the box with Oshkut's lasers. Using a 150 ton press brake to bend a one inch wide piece of thin aluminum might seem a little like overkill, but where I'm from, we say go big or go home. And now that we've gone big, let's go back home. The battery box obviously needs a plug for the high current two watt wires going from the motor to the box. And I'll talk more about this outlet when we actually put the boxes into the Hummer. The center box is now disassembled and the high voltage plate put back about where it used to be. We can start assembling the center box. And eventually it'll look just like the passenger and driver boxes. We just need to bring these two battery modules over there and it looks like this charging system is working where we just balance the cells with this little guy. It just takes about 24 hours per cell. It'll be nice when everything's reassembled and we can push some big boy juice through the charger on the wall instead of just three amps at a time. So we have the passenger box done, the driver side box done, and now it's just time for the center box. And while it might take me a couple hours, for you guys, it is already done. Now the sad part is, well, we can't plug them into the BMS just yet because we don't have the bus bars in place, which means we need to take everything apart. We just had to make sure the wires look pretty now because once we add the bus bars, this thing isn't coming apart again, hopefully. Plus taking apart the boxes will give us an opportunity to wrap all of the wires in abrasion resistant cloth tape. Obviously the wires are sheathed in insulation already. This just adds an extra barrier of protection. It's kind of like putting a case on your cell phone so it doesn't break. And while the battery modules are separated this one last time, we can make sure the battery terminals are super clean for a better connection. With a little bit of acetone and isopropyl alcohol, we can get rid of whatever crusty dielectric compound Tesla was using previously. 
So the way all these high-tech pieces of equipment communicate is through something called a CAN network. And I'm gonna be honest, the whole thing still seems like black magic to me, but apparently there's two wires running between every piece of equipment, a CAN high and a CAN low. And different pieces of equipment, like the display or the BMS, have something called a resistor at the end, which lets the CAN system know that that's the end of one of the branches. And these simple two wires can allow the communication between everything that's connected to the tree of the CAN system. Like I said earlier though, it still seems like black magic, so we'll see if it all works when we're done. One of the ways we can make the wires less subject to interference is by twisting them together in a stranded pair. We know that when electricity flows through a wire, it creates kind of a magnetic field. And by twisting them together, it makes sure that that magnetic field isn't causing interference. Because the CAN wires are so tiny, they need a little more help blocking that interference. When it comes to working with the high voltage or the orange thick wire, it starts to get a little fun. If you remember, the higher the number, the smaller the wire, and the lower the number, the bigger the wire. I'm not the one who came up with it. The wire we're working with is two watt wire, meaning it's two steps below zero. Once again, I didn't come up with the naming scheme. And it's designed for a continuous 250 amps. You can push more through it for smaller durations, but it's rated for 250 amps. Slicing through it, you can see that it's copper strands, all working together to allow electricity to flow from the battery to the motor. The ends of the two watt cable are called lugs. The one I'm working on now is going to a contactor, and I can use my hydraulic crimpers to securely attach that lug to the cable. And then of course some black heat shrink, which we can just use our heat gun. If you look close, there's some glue inside of the heat shrink, and this just helps keep it watertight. Just as a reminder, we routed out the slots underneath the terminals to give it a little more distance from the metal. The rubber running lengthwise between the slits on the base plates is more about dampening vibrations for the batteries. It's not doing much insulating. The vibrations aren't a super big deal since we'll be mounting the batteries inside the Hummer body, where they'll be dampened by the mounts between the body and the frame, and again where the frame connects with the shocks. So the vibrations should be pretty well mitigated unless we start jumping cliffs or something. Right now it's time for the final assembly of the boxes, which means we start to get into the big boy voltage numbers. Like always, I am not an expert in this and I'm just showing you what we're doing. This is not an educational tutorial. I will show you a couple ways that we plan on staying safe, but remember 100%, this is for entertainment, not education. Working with one of these modules probably won't kill you, but two will, and we have 18. So it's really important to stay safe. Let me show you how we're doing that. So we're running power in a couple different ways. When you have one of these 90 degree doohickeys that I'll show you what they do in a second, the rest of which will be running batteries in series, meaning we have a bus bar, which is coated in this insulating material, going from the negative to the positive, negative to the positive. Wiring the batteries in series means that the voltages add up, but the current stays the same. When we're all done, we will have about 450 volts inside of this battery pack. Now, the most dangerous part that we have to worry about is the bare metal. So you can see as the bus bar comes up, there's a bare metal that connects to the terminal of the battery. So the more we can stay away from metal, the safer we'll be. We're also gonna take special care to never touch both ends of the battery at the same time, the positive and negative, from any of the batteries anywhere in between. There's a lot of batteries here. When we do have to work with the battery terminals, attaching the doohickeys or the bus bars, we're gonna use insulated tools. It's metal inside to grab the bolt, but from there, it is insulated from the person using it, as well as we have rubber gloves inside of leather gloves, the rubber gloves are especially designed for high voltage applications, 5,000 volts. And of course, the very basics like safety glasses. All that being said, building an electric vehicle is super fun and super entertaining, but at the same time, at this point in the game, 450 volts is nothing to play around with. If we do everything correctly, there won't be any sparks as we wire things in series. We do just have to remember that 450 volts is a lethal amount of electricity. And so we do have to have respect for the project and respect for the power that is inside of these batteries. 
That being said, let's wire them up. Behold, the box is finished. Well, we haven't put the outside on yet, but we have all the bus bars in place and we have our BMS wires wrapped in that black cloth tape and plugged in to the BMS boards. The most dangerous points are obviously the negative contact there and the positive contact there, staying far away from those. It's about 1 a.m. right now, so we're just gonna throw a piece of rubber over the top to make sure no one accidentally brushes against those contacts. No one comes in here but us though, so I think we'll be all right. And we are very close to getting the center box and final box wired and then hopefully get the tire spinning. Fingers crossed. We've had this box off so we can wire the BMS wires and add the bus bars, but now it's time to remove this plate that contains all the high voltage equipment and throw it inside of the box. And you can kind of see how things are going to look at this point with each of the modules inside the boxes and how the boxes are modular. To get the motor spinning, we have to connect all three boxes through those pieces of conduit we cut earlier. Each box has three holes cut on the side for the super thick two watt cables. As well as the rat's nest of BMS wires, which is more of a controlled rat's nest now that the cloth tape is applied. Like I always say, proper wire management is paramountly important. And once again, just to reiterate, this portion of the project, connecting all the batteries, is the most dangerous. When you work on a regular car, there isn't a whole lot inside that's instantaneously deadly. Unless you swallow a whole tank of gasoline. With electric vehicles though, these batteries are ready to go, wanting to get from one terminal to the other, and will pass through anything conductive to get there including a human body. Not only will it kill you, but it will hurt the whole time you are dying. I don't want to be a downer, just an advocate for caution, especially since you can't see electricity. Now that we have the boxes pretty well wired, we can finally test the cell taps that we wired earlier. You know, the 180 super small wires. I'll explain all these connections here in a second, but the cell taps plug into the BMS and they look like this. And they're monitoring the voltage from all the way from volt one down there, all the way up here to volt 450. But we can only plug them into the BMS when they're all wired correctly. And to double check, we have this tool here. And the reason we do that, because if we accidentally wired up, let's say volt 40 to volt 300, it would fry the BMS. So we have to be careful with that, since the BMS is pretty expensive, like the rest of this project. But now that it's good on every single bank, we can finish plugging them in. So now that every single wire is connected, I can explain what's going on. So as we know, over there is the electric motor in the electric Humvee, and it needs to get its power from all of these batteries. So we're gonna start off here at the negative most battery, which is right here, the negative most terminal. All of the batteries are wired in series, meaning that the voltage adds up as we go down the rows to our most positive terminal here, which is 450 volts, which I'm staying very far away from with my bare hands. 
and eventually this will be in the seats behind the driver and passenger we've just wired it up here to test everything and when they're in the passenger and driver's seat of course they will have these metal boxes over them as well as conduit running from each box three conduits one for the 2 watt, one for the BMS wires, and one for the 2 watt. Same over here on the other side. Three pieces of conduit. Now the BMS is taking all of those voltages from each of the batteries and will give us a ton of information, as well as this current sensor right here of how much power is flowing through this piece of cable. This fuse right here allows 500 amps to flow through continuously, but if anything were to go wrong and something short out, little pieces of metal inside of this would break, which would sever the connection on the cable and stop power from flowing through the system. Then of course we have our Wi-Fi module, so I won't have to physically plug into this. I can get it wirelessly through the air. And then we have the final two components over here on this end. On this side of the box, like I mentioned, we have two bare contactors, as well as a pre-charge resistor. You'll notice that this gold resistor is connected to both sides of this positive terminal. That's because if we were to send all the power through immediately, the contactor is just like a switch, there would be an arc, a 450 volt arc inside of that contactor. The pre-charge resistor just allows a trickle of electricity to flow through to bring the voltage up so that there's no arc when it does finally close. I'll talk more about the BMS later, but as we can see right now through the CAN system, it can read all of the different voltages from each of these different battery modules. And balancing just means keeping the cells from going out of whack. One's not being charged more than the other. And lastly, we have a very small AC to DC converter. And that guy's gonna take voltage from the port where we plug in and power the BMS while it's charging. So we're not draining our 12 volt battery. Because the 12 volt battery is what's gonna be running all of this equipment as we're driving down the road. Now you might think I'm talking a lot. Maybe it's because there's a lot of information or maybe I'm just stalling because I'm not sure I wanna hook 450 volts up to the Humvee just yet. But there's only one way to find out if it works. And that's by connecting it. With the two out wires connected to the contactors and the wheels off the ground, plus we are in neutral for the transfer case, I can turn the key and see if it's working. Uh, when I turn the key, we should hear two clicks over there by the contactors. I'm gonna turn it. That was the second one. So since we're in neutral here, if I press the accelerator, I'll clean up my wires later, of course. Nothing happens, but as soon as I switch this to forward, then I reach down and touch the accelerator. Oh, yes. That's amazing. So to get the wheel spinning, we do have to switch the transfer case into gear. We have Jacob in the driver's seat now. We're gonna get all four tires spinning at the same time. Sick, I think we're in low. Do you wanna switch us to high? All right, now we're in regular drive with the wheels spinning faster before we were in a low gear for crawling. What's super cool is you can see the drive shaft coming from the motor to the transfer case as well as through the hole in the floor going from the transfer case to the rear differential. And then of course, coming back here to the front differential to spin both of these front tires. All of this movement is made possible by the 450 volts of batteries over there. All right, now that we know the tire spin, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but I wanna see I did say we would have this rolling by the end of the year, and I'm gonna get it rolling even if it's just a few feet. We're still tethered to the battery box, but let's get this rolling. So we are officially on the ground, going for our first drive. 
in the Humvee. So we are in neutral, forward. Oh man, one wrong move, we can go through the garage. Going slow. Oh my gosh. Dude. Am I good? Am I close there? Am I good? Okay, we went forward. Keep my promises. We got this rolling by the end of the year. Going backwards. Oh man, this is gonna be so much fun. Oh yeah. Sick. Okay. Going back into neutral. Turning it off. I do have to say that is infinitely better than a Flintstone car. This project has been super fun. I know over the past year that I have learned a ton. And while this might be an adult sized project, something that's fun for toddlers, children, teens, and adults of all ages is KiwiCo. KiwiCo's mission is to provide the next generation of innovators with the tools and a foundation to become critical thinkers, while at the same time having fun being problem solvers. KiwiCo provides fun monthly hands-on projects designed to expose kids to concepts in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And the kits they provide are great for learning at home. KiwiCo has eight subscription lines designed by experts for toddlers, kids, teenagers, and even adults. And these kits come with everything you need. No need to run out for extra supplies. My wife has been giving these subscriptions away as gifts for the holidays or for birthdays. I'll leave a link down in the description so you can get your first month for free. One of the mini kits is this light up wire art that teaches the basics of electronic circuits with batteries, wires, plugs, and switches with very safe, easy to handle batteries. Trust me, it's much better to start learning with two double A's than 8,000 18650s like we're doing here on the Electric Hummer project. Like I mentioned earlier, KiwiCo is a great way for kids to learn at home and make fantastic gifts for holidays or birthdays. Learning and expanding your mind today will make tomorrow's problems much easier. That first free month with your subscription is down in the description. So I know we had plans to make this thing completely mobile and drivable by the end of the year, but looks like I will be slightly delayed along with all of the other electric trucks. Turns out building an electric truck is fairly difficult, but we have made a ton of progress this year that I am very happy with. I do post quite a few updates over on Twitter and Instagram if you want to join us over there. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss when we actually drive out of the garage. And leave any questions down in the comments. Thanks a ton for watching, and I'll see you around.